Profound, really. I think that week in, week out, for the last 2,000 plus years, God's people have gathered to worship God on the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And so really, this morning as we come to hear God's word, we're not coming to hear some you know, wisdom from some guy who lived and died thousands of years ago, but we're coming to hear the word of the living God, the one who has the keys to life and death in his hands. So let's pray as we approach God's word. God, we pray that you would speak to us this morning. Amen. This morning we're in Luke chapter 7. If you have a Bible, do open it up. Uh, verse 1 to verse 10 of Luke chapter 7. And uh, I'll give you a moment to find it. So Jesus has now finished his sermon on the plane that we've been going through over the last few weeks. And um, so we're moving on from there in Luke chapter 7 verses 1 to 10. And it says this. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and was at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders from the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I say, this one, I say to this one, go, and he goes. To the other one I say, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Amazing. So I, I just want to kind of remind us of some, of some things that we all probably know, but it's helpful to be refreshed on about just basically the nature of stories. We have to bear in mind that this is part of uh, a book. This is part of a wider story, and every story has its own little stories within it. So kind of two things to, to bear in mind. One thing is, why is Luke including this story at all? Let's just bear in mind that Luke is writing a gospel, an account of Jesus for someone. The beginning of Luke chapter 1, he, he addresses it to what's probably his friend and who was probably a Roman senator, Theophilus. And he says that he's writing an orderly account for Theophilus so that he may have certainty of these things. So it's one story, if you like, but that one story, just as with every other story, is made up of lots of small ones. Now, when we are forming our stories, we decide what to include and what not to include for a reason. We don't include every single detail that we possibly know about something. Otherwise, it would uh, just take too long to explain and be a mess, and the person who's trying to hear the story wouldn't quite understand it. And so we emphasize the bits that we want to emphasize. I mean, for instance, what's the difference between the way the Daily Mail and the Guardian report on the same story? Same event. One wants to emphasize a certain thing. The other wants to emphasize a, a different thing. So you end up reading kind of two different stories, but it's the same story from two with two different amounts of events emphasized. So the question is, why is Luke including this story? Is it just another healing story? There's quite a lot of those. Does he need another one? The second question, or the second point about stories is, often the knowledge we have before we get to them tells us a lot about what we're expecting. So for instance, the story of the tortoise and the hare. If you know what a tortoise is and you know what a hare is, you know that one is fast and one is slow. And so when you get to a story and you hear about them having a race, you already know there's one I'm expecting to be a winner, there's one I'm expecting to be a loser. If you don't know what a tortoise is and a hare is, then the moral of the story is, if you're having a race, don't sleep, which seems a redundant 
moral, really. We all know that if you want to win a race, you don't sleep halfway through. The story's moral is that pride comes before a fall because we're, we're surprised that the hare has lost and the tortoise has won. The knowledge that we bring to it affects how we're expecting the story to go and then surprises us when it goes another way. Just keep those things in mind as we get to this story. I'm not denying its truthfulness, of course. No, every, every story can be true. But let's just focus on the, emphasis, the, the, the places that Luke is emphasizing. What are the elements of this story? What does this mean to Theophilus, his original, or his original audience? What does it mean to us? Why include it? What's the message going on here? Is it a story about healing, as I say? Who are the characters? So the first thing I just want us to, to look at as we get into it is we have this character of Centurion. Now, in the ancient world, uh, and particularly in ancient Israel, the world is divided into Jews and non-Jews, Gentiles. All, the, all of the Bible, up until Luke is written by Jews, Luke is the first Gentile writing to a Gentile. Now, the Jews separated themselves from Gentiles. They, we are not them. It's a them and an us situation. But around this kind of time, in the last kind of 200 years, as societies are starting to merge, there emerges this kind of third category in between Jew and Gentile called a God-fearer. Gentiles who had kind of taken an interest in Judaism, in the religion of Israel, and had kind of started to stand at the back of services and kind of wonder what's going on here. Now, in our modern world, we like to go with what's new, what's, um, what's modern, what's uh, exciting, what can I form my worldview around now? But in the ancient world, the thinking is, the oldest thing surely is the most correct. That has the best wisdom. And so people start looking around for the oldest viewpoints, the oldest philosophies, the oldest religions. And so Judaism attracted quite a number of these people because it is ancient. And so these God-fearers would get involved. They'd do the things that the Jews do. They would give money to the temple. They would join in on the synagogue services. But the one thing they wouldn't do is become circumcised. For adult males at that time, you can imagine that didn't really sound that appealing. Now, for the Jews, obviously, this is a huge deal. Circumcision is the symbol that we belong in this people. And so the reason these God-fearers kind of form this third category is because they're kind of in, but they're kind of out. They're like an outsider on the inside. And that's exactly what we have here with this centurion. Not only is he a Gentile, so he's already an outsider, not only is he a Roman soldier, so he's part of the occupying force, but he's also a centurion. He's a leader of the occupational force. And so we're introduced here to our tortoise. This is the person who is on the outside. This is the one who is not going to take the fancy of uh, the Jewish religious leaders and the people who are hearing Jesus' message. And so, as a respectful man, as a, as a man who wants to respect the different cultures that are going on, he sends not his own messages, but he sends elders from the Jews to go and find Jesus. Now, this doesn't just mean old people, it means leaders, leaders of a synagogue most likely. It would be like uh, sending our, the elders of our church to go and invite someone in. <clears throat> so they have a certain authority, they have a certain... Um, uh, as a, they, are, they are respected within that community that Jesus is part of. So sending them seems a good idea. But what we find is, as they come to him, there's two attitudes that are revealed. The insiders and the outsiders have two very different attitudes. Let's, let's hear what the Jews come as they say to Jesus. The elders, the ones who represent the synagogue, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, he is worthy to have you do this for him. That he loves our nation, and he is the one who built our synagogue. Well, there you go, if you want to prove that you love God's people help with the building fund. <laughs> the point is, the attitude is, look, we know this guy's on the outside. And we know that we're kind of in this together. But he kind of deserves it. If, if you come along, 
you'd be really doing what's right because listen to all the things he does. He loves our nation and, you know, he built us a synagogue. So, Jesus, the right thing really is for you to come along. Now, there, there is an assumption that Jesus has the power to do this miracle. I'm not denying that. They think that Jesus has the ability to cure this man's servant. But the way in which they ask him tells a lot about their view of Jesus. We're in the same boat. Do this one for us. A bit further down, the attitude of the outsider, the God-fearer, the centurion, the one who hasn't been circumcised, the one who isn't part of this nation, he says this, do not trouble yourself. I I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. Just say the word and let my servant be healed. I'm a centurion. Come to my house. Nope. Did you not hear about all the wonderful things I've done for your people? Nope. Can you hurry up already? No. I don't deserve to have you in my house. Speak from afar. I know you have the authority. This is the complete reversal. The outsider, the irony of this story is that the outsider is speaking as though he was an insider. What do I mean by that? To be a Jew isn't merely to be part of this society. To be a Jew is to know the God that we worship, to know the God that we believe in. There's a certain humility in there. Take that sign that we talked about, circumcision. What bars the Gentile from being considered part of the group? What does that sign signify? The sign of circumcision is a sign to say, I am humbled before God. I am repenting before God. I depend on God. The circumcised people in the characters, in this, the circumcised characters in the story don't display any of that. They're not living up to their circumcision. You know, and you ask, how do you live up to having a piece of skin cut off? What does it mean? This is what the book of Romans says in Romans chapter 2. Circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of, his law, of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. It's exactly what we're having in this story. The uncircumcised, the one on the outside, is behaving as though he was the one on the inside with that sign, with the uh, contrite heart before God. He is living up to the signs of what it means to be God's people, while those who are claiming to be God's people approach God with arrogance and arm-pulling. You but we deserve to have you do this for us. How does this apply to us? What do we do with this? The message is this. If you take on the title and the signs of what it means to be a Christian, to be a Christ follower, you must live up to those signs. To be someone who is baptized. What does Romans 6 say? You were baptized into Christ Therefore, put to death the deeds of the flesh. The image there is you haven't just taken a sign, you've taken an identity. And the irony is hypocrisy, really, when the person who's taken on the sign is acting as though they don't know the God that they're worshipping. To be a Christian, to call ourselves that name, means I am in submission to Christ, I worship Christ, I know Christ, I have faith in him. If we are Christ, we must live up to that title. I have a friend who was a Christian for eight months before he started a Bible college. And one of the things he said was when he got there, he was surprised 
at how little everyone else who had been a Christian, were grown up in Christian families, knew about the Bible. Now, that, that's not to say that Christian maturity is measured by how much Bible knowledge you have. I'm not saying that. For him, it was a shock because eight months ago, he had come across something that was earth-shattering, that changed his life. And he had just devoured everything he could on it. And yet people who had had it their whole lives, had so much more time than him to dig in, had treated it as though it was something that I'll get to later. The irony of having people that these are the ones who can go to Jesus. These are the ones who represent the Jewish people. And they're the ones who completely miss the point. The insiders act like those on the outside. Meanwhile, the centurion, the tortoise, he is the one who speaks to God as though he were talking to God. And so that as we go past that, we then come to what Jesus says in response. Now just... Listen to the beginning of verse 9. When Jesus heard these things, he was amazed, or he marveled at them. That word, amazed, marveled, surprised, appears lots of times in the Gospels. But almost every time it appears, it's in reference to the crowd's reaction to Jesus. There is only two occasions when it is, when it is used for Jesus. Once in, in Mark 6, verse 6, where it says he was amazed at their unbelief. He was shocked at how little they believed. The second time here, when he is amazed, astonished, surprised, marveling at the faith of this person who's supposed to be the outsider, who's supposed to be the tortoise. What kind of faith is it that amazes Jesus? What kind of faith is it that has the Son of God surprised what kind of faith is it that has a centurion, the leader of the Roman army, speak to a peasant from Nazareth who's part of his occupying nation in such a manner that he says, I am not worthy of having you in my house? What leads a man who has all this authority, who can say to people, go and they go, come and they come, do this and they do that, what kind of faith is it that takes that person to say to a peasant they've never met, I do not deserve to host you. And so Jesus then turns to the crowd and he says, not even in Israel have I found such faith. What an indictment it is for the Son of God to speak to God's people in this manner. To say that your faith has been outshone by someone that you consider to be on the outside. How do you think this would affect that crowd, the ones who are following Jesus, the ones who are saying, we're Israel, we're the ones waiting for the Messiah, we know he's coming soon, we think this might be him, so we're going to follow him around. To have him then turn to you and say, this centurion, this tortoise, has beaten you hares. What does it do to them? What does it do to Theophilus as he's reading this? This Roman senator who is himself knowing I'm an outsider to this religion, reading this and going, Jesus is looking for that from me. He's not looking for me to become a Jew. He's looking for me to have this kind of faith. He's looking for me as an outsider to become an insider. What does it do to us? How would we feel to have Jesus turn to us and say, you who are supposed to be my people, who are supposed to know what it means to follow me, your faith has been outshone by those who you consider to be on the outside. One of the big themes that we get as we go through Luke, which is unsurprising, as I say, considering he's the first Gentile writer of the Bible, is this huge theme that those on the outside are becoming the inside, that the poor are being seen as rich, that the Gentiles are being seen as God's people. 
that the widows and the poor and everyone who you consider to be on the margins, God is drawing them in to the center. What is it that draws them in? What is the means? Does God just like them because they're disadvantaged? No, it's the faith. It's faith that doesn't just say, you have the power and you should do it really. You know, I've got this family member who, uh, Lord, they've served you all their life and they're ill now, so really you should be healing them. You know, quid pro quo. We've done this for you, do it in return. That's not faith in Christ. Faith in Christ is saying, Lord, sovereign Lord, no one but you can do this and so we plead with you. We don't deserve you, but you have brought us in. The great irony of the Christian life is that the way up is the way down. What the centurion has found here is that his exaltation is not found in him bullying those underneath him or strong-arming this peasant from his occupying nation to come into him. His exaltation is found in his humility. That the way to see the top of the mountain is to find ourselves at the bottom of the valley. As we humble ourselves before God, he responds by crowning us with royalty in his kingdom. That the less we think of ourselves, the more God does to elevate us. The healing really is just tagged on to the end. Verse 10, and then those who sent him returned home and they found the servant well. Luke hasn't included this story for us because it's interesting to hear that Jesus doesn't have to be there to heal them. The healing just gives us a a framing for this story. The healing is not what's important. What's important is when Jesus is shocked, when Jesus experiences that kind of faith. We're presented here with a tortoise and a hare, the ones on the inside and the ones on the outside. And what Jesus does is he brings those on the outside in. That's really quite challenging and revolutionary, I think, for the way that we view ourselves, the way that we view mission, the way that we view evangelism. We talk about the kingdom, but we often think about the kingdom in the way that we view other earthly kingdoms. It's like as we talked about a few weeks ago, this is an upside-down kingdom. We might consider ourselves on the inside, and that's fine if we do, but let's consider the challenge that passages like this, passages like this give us. Being on the inside can breed over-familiarity. It can breed pride. It can breed contempt. It can breed ignorance. It can breed complacency. Jesus shakes things up. Jesus is reformulating Israel. Jesus is reformulating his church. Jesus is letting the hares sleep while the tortoises cross the finish line. I could probably stand here for another hour and say all the ways that Jesus intends to do that in our society, but I think we all know that that is a challenge in our own lives, in the way that we view the church's role, in the way that we view mission. And so I'll let the Spirit press those things on you rather than um, going on with it. But I just want that challenge to sit with us. I want that challenge to remain with us. I just want us to consider that reality that Jesus shakes up the structures that we're used to, that Jesus brings those who we consider to be on the borders and he makes them the capital city. Let's pray. Lord God, we profess to believe in you. And we profess that you are the God who created heaven and earth and everything in it. That you are the God who became one of us, defeated death and rose. You're the God who is putting all enemies under Christ's feet and is establishing his kingdom on this earth. You're the God who when the nations rage and say, let us cast off his bonds from us, you respond and you laugh. And you say, as for me, I've set my chosen one on Zion. 
Lord, if we profess those things, help us to believe those things. Lord, we've sung radical things this morning. We've sung that we believe that we will rise again, that we believe in God, our Father, in Christ the Son, in the Holy Spirit, that we believe in the triune God. Lord, teach that belief, that faith to come out in practice. Not to be a faith that merely says, you have the ability to heal, so get on with it. You have the ability to bless us, so hurry up. But Lord, a faith that says, how is it that I am welcomed in with the God of all ages? Teach us to know you more, we pray, Lord. Teach us to be like that centurion. Amen.